The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. It is news parents have been waiting for, but also worried about, COVID-19 vaccines for young children. The U.S. could start inoculations as early as next week, and Canada might not be too far behind. So tonight, we get some science insight to help parents make that choice once we get the word here. Then Steve talks to podcaster and now author Ralph ben Mergi about his new book with a title that says it all, I Thought He Was Dead, A Spiritual Memoir. And we'll hear from our Hamilton Niagara Hub on what inflation looks like to people who rely on the Ontario Disability Support Program. It's Friday, October 29th, and that's next on the agenda. Almost 85% of eligible Ontarians are now fully vaccinated. And that eligible part is set to expand in the coming weeks to include children 5 to 11 years of age. That means parents have a decision to make. To help them, let's find out from Dr. Janine McCready, infectious disease physician at Michael Guerin Hospital, and Samantha Yamin, a neuroscientist and science communicator, also known as Science Sam, both in the provincial capital. Hi, it's very nice to meet you both. Lovely to meet you. Thanks for having us. So I am a parent of two kids, eight and ten. So I've been looking forward to this conversation. But um, you're both part of a co of a coalition called Science Up First. Sam, can you explain to us what that is? Science Up First is a group that's all about using creative uh, and excited, innovative ways to combat misinformation. And they do a lot of that online and through social media. So check them out everywhere at Science Up First for English content and La Science d'abord for French content. Well, it's great that you are here to talk us through this because um, I think a lot of parents um, who've had the vaccine, I've had the vaccine. I got the first one that was available to me. But now with my kids, I have to be honest, I'm not sure what to do. So, um, Janine, if you can catch us up to speed, an FDA expert um, uh, committee recommended authorization for Pfizer's COVID vaccine for children 5 to 11 years old. How close is Health Canada to doing that? So they are very close. So Health Canada has all the same data that the FDA has been going through. So all the data on the uh, efficacy of the vaccine in this 5 to 11 age group and also the safety of the vaccine. So they are pouring over the data. And then they're also looking at specific questions like what should the dosing interval be uh, here in Canada for the 5 to 11 age group? And what do you do if your child is 11, but they're turning 12 in January and all those all those specific questions. So they are um, the panel of experts is really having a look at all of that data. And I think they're quite close. We're anticipating that really in the next few weeks, we will uh, see an approval from Health Canada, uh, at just as similar to what we're going to see in the United States. Kids older than 12 have been getting a vaccine in this country. How different will the vaccine be for uh, younger kids, Janine? So the vaccine is a smaller dose. So the uh, the adult and the 12 plus dose was about 30 micrograms of the active ingredient. And in the kids 5 to 11, it'll be 10 micrograms. And the reason they did that is because kids aren't just little adults. So their immune systems are even more amazing than adult immune systems. And so they uh, wanted to basically look at different doses in the children to see what dose would provide them with robust protection against COVID, but to minimize the side effects. So that's why they actually looked at a 30 microgram dose, a 20 microgram dose, and a 10 microgram dose. And the 10 microgram dose protected them against COVID and then also had similar, actually fewer side effects than what we see in even the, uh, the older cohorts, which is fantastic. And Sam, I loved what Janine said, that kids are just not little adults. Um, in your view, mm -hmm. how has the information around children and vaccines been communicated by government and scientists? I think there has been a lot of polarizing conversations with regards to kids and COVID. It's been a really challenging time for parents and there are a lot of uh, emotions and a lot of challenges and a lot of things to consider. Um, I think that we have unfortunately downplayed the risk of COVID in kids. I think a lot of people are dismissing it because we haven't seen um, you know, as many kids as adults be hospitalized. But just because it seems like a relatively low risk, it doesn't mean it's no risk. And I think we have to still recognize that there are severe outcomes that COVID, uh, COVID could cause for kids, uh, including unique ones like MIS-C, which is a multi-inflammatory um, 
disorder that's happening in kids, which can result in myocarditis, and then long COVID as well is also happening in kids. So I want parents to know, like, there are things you can do until the approval comes to protect your kids, but we can't keep pretending like the risk to kids is absolutely zero because it's not. Well, um, Sam, I'm glad that you brought that up because, Janine, we know that in this province uh, there's been a few children who have died after getting COVID. And then yet during this pandemic, the message that we seem to have been getting is that uh, when it comes to COVID, children are okay. Now that the vaccine is possibly going to become available. So how do you shift from saying that kids are okay if they do get um, uh, COVID and then try to um, get parents to understand that if they do get COVID, it's actually very serious. It can be potentially fatal. Yeah, I think it's a big challenge because, I mean, as you said, we've been saying this for months that it's it's no big deal, but we know it can be a big deal. And I mean, in the, the States, they have a lot of good data from the children and they're out of almost 9,000 kids in the 5 to 11 age group that have been in to hospital over the course of the pandemic, 30% of them had no comorbidities, which means they were perfectly healthy children that ended up getting admitted to hospital. And yes, you know, that overall it's rare and death is rare, but I think the, what we need to understand is that the risk from severe side effects and even mild side effects and the risk from any severe complications mm -hmm. from the vaccine is infinitesimal compared to what those risks are from not only the health risks from COVID in the short and long term, but also the mental health for kids, you know, being able to have that vaccine and be able to get back to you know, playing sports and hugging their grandma and hugging vulnerable people without feeling scared that they're going to pass something on to them. Um, I think those are all really important concerns. And so for me as a parent and for, as an infectious disease doctor, looking at the, you know, the risks of COVID and the risks of the pandemic continuing for children um, versus the risks of the vaccine, it's, it's really an easy choice for me you know, my kids will be uh, first in line to get vaccinated. Uh, and Sam, you know, we've been hearing that uh, some children after uh, getting the vaccine, older kids, I guess, uh, between 12 and 17, have been getting um, a heart condition. Um, can you ex talk mm -hmm. about that? And if that's something that could happen if younger children do get the vaccine? Sure. So we've, there's been a lot of talk about myocarditis or pericarditis, which is uh, quite complex, but essentially some sort of inflammation related to heart tissue. What I think is really important for people to know on this is, one, this is something being taken very seriously. Uh, and this is probably one of the major adverse events that people are looking into when it comes to the approval. So rest assured that it will be well investigated. The reassuring thing here is that the vaccine-induced myocarditis tends to have much better outcomes and be much more mild and, and even self-resolving than the myocarditis that can come from COVID infection itself. So I, I want people to know that uh, myocarditis is common, uh, a, com a complication from COVID infection um, and, and a much more rare and much more mild side effect of COVID vaccines. And two other reassuring things when it comes to this age group, the 5 to 11s, is the myocarditis risk seems to decrease with age, and we're now using a lower dose in this age group. And so uh, even though in the 12 plus group, it was relatively quite rare, I think it's likely we'll see it being even more rare in this lower group, given the lower dose, and in general that it tends to decrease with age. Janine, I saw you nodding. Yeah, no, I completely agree with everything that Sam has said. And I think the um, the other thing that we have seen in the older age group is that um, most or almost all of the cases of myocarditis have, have occurred in that older age group after the second uh, dose of the mm -hmm. vaccine. And it's exceedingly rare in the first dose. And so, you know, if you, even if you are a bit worried, you know, the risks with that first dose of vaccine are even rarer. So, you know, get your kids the first dose and then you can wait a bit. Well, the United States is likely going to be a bit ahead of us on this uh, just because they usually are. And if they use that three week dosing interval and if, if Health Canada here does do a little bit longer interval, I'm not sure if they will. But from what we've seen with the success with um, older populations, we might then we'll have time to, to make sure in a real life situation that there isn't uh, you know, a, a big concern there. But I completely agree with Sam. I think that it, it will I likely expect it will be even safer in this younger group. We know that uh, pregnant women can get vaccinated. Is there a vaccine that's being worked on for children that are younger than five? 
Yes, uh, so there are. So um, the main two, Pfizer and Moderna, are both actively doing studies uh, on the children in the age group younger than five. So trials are ongoing. And again, they are looking at adjusting that dose, you know, potentially even, even lower for that younger age group, again, to use the their amazing immune systems to be able to make sure that they have a robust uh, immune response, but also minimal side effects. So both the Pfizer uh, and Moderna studies are ongoing. And I think that the results are kind of expected either towards the end of this year or early next year. Uh, Sam, uh, a forum research poll found that nearly 70% of Ontario parents will vaccinate their children once it's given the green light from Health Canada. 20% uh, are not so sure, and 10% have said that they won't give them the vaccine. Um, what, what concerns are parents sharing about having their children vaccinated? Those are really, really reassuring numbers, uh, and that's, that's really great to hear. What I've been hearing from parents is just um, a concern about long-term effects. This is a, a thing that a lot of people get worried about when it comes to vaccines. And so I want to reassure folks who are also wondering about, well, what if something happens down the road? I can tell you why we're confident that uh, about the safety long-term. And that's because the vaccine product itself doesn't last in the body for more than a few days and then in trace amounts for weeks and then that's it, it's cleared from the body. So any direct impacts are not gonna happen because the vaccine is just gone, it's not there. And that's why we see most things that do happen including allergies happening right away. And then when it comes longer term, the thing that does stick around is that immune memory. And we know immune memory is incredibly safe. In fact, it's very protective. Um, and so that's why we're not, you know, you don't have to worry about like, is this gonna have an issue for my kid five years down the road? The reason we're confident is that no, in the history of all vaccines that we that we use and that are approved today, um, any rare serious adverse events typically happen in the first few weeks, at most a few months, and not down the road. And, and that's for that real physiological reason, the vaccine's not around and the immune memory is very stable. So that's a big concern and I hope that reassures parents worrying about that. And Janine, you know, one thing that I've seen uh, people um, on social media talking about is the fact that if all the adults who were eligible to get vaccinated um, if they had been vaccinated, that we wouldn't be in a situation where mm -hmm. we're kind of crossing our fingers as to when kids can be vaccinated. Um, and, you know, some parents are saying that they're not sure about making this decision for their their children. Uh, and we do make decisions for them to be immunized in other places um, um, with that. But um, so how do you um, how do you con how do you combat, I guess, vaccine hesitancy when you are talking to parents? I mean, it's, it's a great question. And I, I find every conversation I have is a little bit different and everybody has slightly different concerns and it's really getting to the root of, you know, why they're, why they're worried and, and what questions they need answered. I mean, some people have had, you know, a family member that's had an adverse event or, you know, they, they may be worried for many different reasons or if they're from, you know, they have family back in it in a different country that they may have different experiences with different vaccines there. So it's really getting to the, you know, the root of what they are worried about and making sure that people can get answers and that they're getting you know the right information because you can find anything on the internet these days and it really you know that's why these places like science up first are so important because you can get you know good information that's reliable um and i think that you know i think the talking about the effects of covid we 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 do you know, there's been so much that's really been said to try and reassure people to not be worried about their children. And so really reinforcing that you, you have to look at the big picture. And unfortunately, you know, with Delta, it is very infectious. And if your children stay unvaccinated or you stay unvaccinated, then at some point, likely you will get COVID. And hopefully you will have mild symptoms, but there is a chance that you will have more severe symptoms. And the longer we go on and then the more society opens up, the best protection is really having that vaccine. Um, Premier Ford was asked about vaccinating children against COVID. This is what he had to say. There are a million kids between 5 and 11 in Ontario. Is the province relying on them to get to 90 percent? Because there's one and a half million adults who are still eligible yeah. and unvaccinated. And if we're well, not... I'm going to leave that up to the parents when it comes to 5 to 11 years or olds. Uh, do we want to get them vaccinated? Yes, but there are some parents that are vaccinated. They're a little hesitant at the age of 5 or 6. I get it. So let's do our best and get as many people vaccinated. And I also understand if they don't want to get their five-year-old or six-year-old vaccinated, do I want everyone to? 100%.
Sam, what do you think of the uh, Premier's communication on this? Um, it's, <laughs> it's a little confusing to interpret. Um, I, I think the more important thing to focus on here is is not focusing on the fact that some parents don't want to get their kids vaccinated, but trying to get to the root, like Janine said, of why that is and connecting them with the information. I think it's fair for parents to be concerned, and I think that's what the premier was maybe alluding to, but uh, we should be reassuring them, not kind of just move, I don't know, he, he's so apathetic about it. And I, I want us to say like, I get that you're concerned, but let's talk about it. <laughs> Well, you know, as part of the province's reopening plan, uh, Premier Ford announced that uh, vaccine mandates will be phased out come January. Uh, for parents who may be on the fence about getting uh, their children vaccinated, uh, what message does that send, Sam? I, I really didn't love that we're putting a, a time limit on the mandates when really it should be based on pandemic outcomes. And I think this is kind of um, not emphasize. he's not emphasizing the importance of as many people in the community being vaccinated as possible. And that is really what's key here. I think if we all have the same goal of moving on from this pandemic, that's only gonna happen when everyone in the community and kids are a big part of that community get vaccinated. So when he's making it so temporary um, and, and not emphasizing the urgency and the seriousness of everyone getting vaccinated, I think that sends the wrong message of how we get out of this. It's not just time, it's our collective efforts and we need everyone on board for that. Um, and just to build on that, Janine, um, we've had these breakthrough cases of adults who've been vaccinated and still gotten COVID. And I think now, because we have this out in January and the Premier has said that uh, it's a very cautious plan that if the numbers do go up, they will change course. Um, but if you do have this out and there are breakthrough cases for people who've been vaccinated, how do you then and convince parents to have their children vaccinated? I mean, I think it becomes more challenging. And I mean, like Sam said, it would really be great if, you know, all of us were all on the same page on this in terms of the leaders and the public health officials and, you know, all of us on the front lines that, you know, we, we really do feel that this is the, the best thing for everyone on an individual and a societal level. And so, you know, we want to protect people's uh, people's health and also being able to make sure that the schools stay open and they're safe places. Um, so, you know, again, putting that timestamp on it, it, it does worry me that it's going to undermine a lot of the good work that's being done. Um, and with regards to breakthrough infections, I mean, we do see people that get COVID-19 after the vaccination, but the infections are much less severe. So it's exceedingly rare for people to end up uh, sick and in hospital. And it's also less likely for them to pass it on to other people and way less likely for them to get infected in the first place. So, you know, it's it's definitely not a reason to, to not get vaccinated because it still makes you, you know, much less likely to have any of those severe outcomes or pass it on to your loved ones. Um, but it's another reason why, you know, it, it's not a bulletproof vest, but if everyone in the community is vaccinated, then it turns what can be a very severe illness into a mild cold. Uh, and, you know, we just need to get everybody protected so that, as, as Sam said, we can kind of move forward um, and, and really, truly get past this pandemic. So speaking of moving forward, if the vaccine for children is approved, Janine, um, how is the province planning on rolling out the vaccines? Yeah, so I think, I mean, there's lots of different talks at all the different public health unit levels. And I know uh, here in, you know, East Toronto, we've been working on our plan and basically a combination of making sure we can get the information out to parents. So reaching out to those communities, using trusted partners that are, you know, in, in actually in all these communities um, and making sure people's questions are answered. So we're running a number of local and then larger forums uh, with basic, you know, Q and A so parents can get the answers directly from people people like me and, and trusted people in the community. Um, and then in terms of our plan for rollout, it's really about accessibility. So we know that the federal government has done an amazing job procuring the vaccine, and they have said that there will be enough doses for you know every child five to eleven to, to have their dose if they you know would like one. So hopefully it won't be the Hunger Games of the vaccination like it was with the older age groups. Um, and so there'll be a combination of the bigger mass immunization sites as well as uh, more accessible local school-based clinics. So we have a plan to visit schools, kind of moving from schools that are were higher risk 
been hit harder by cases uh, throughout the pandemic, and then really offering it to pretty much all the schools in the area. Um, and as well through pharmacies, family physicians, pediatricians. Uh, and we know that with kids, there's going to be a variety of approaches. So some kids are going to be worried about getting the needles and, and more um, anxious about it, and other kids are going to be okay. So making sure that we have environments where kids feel safe and their families feel comfortable bringing them to, uh, to get those vaccines, uh, and, and that there are different options for, for different kids so that we can make sure everyone's, uh, you know, has a good experience and it feels, uh, feels that they are okay to, to come and get that vaccine. Um, Sam, yesterday, Dr. Kieran Moore, the province's chief medical officer, said that the COVID vaccine wouldn't be made mandatory for children to attend school. He said that if it does become a persistent yearly virus, then it will be revisited. Uh, should it be mandatory that children receive the COVID vaccine before attending school? Um, it's, it's tricky for that decision. I think the, it, it's not uncommon for us to say that vaccinations required in a school setting. I think it makes a lot of sense. Kids are really close, spending lots of time together in a classroom. So other vaccines are mandatory. The flu vaccine isn't in schools. However, it's highly encouraged. And so I think they're trying to take that same approach. Um, I really hope that that makes parents feel a little more comfortable, that they have a little bit less pressure to make that decision. And I hope that parents um, use that uh, time to really listen to key credible sources uh, and learn about all of the exciting and really reassuring research so that they do feel confident making that decision so that the mandates aren't necessary. Uh, and Janine, you know, schools have been open now for about two months. How safe has it been for students to attend school? I mean, I, I think the schools here in Ontario, we've, we've done a really great job. I mean, we do have a lot of added safety measures that we haven't seen necessarily in, in other provinces. So, I mean, universal masking, uh, increasing uh, ventilation in the classrooms, cohorting of classes, good screening and easy access to testing, I think have all really helped us to minimize exposures within the classroom. Uh, I know at the beginning of the year before we started thinking about how this more infectious variant Delta would spread, I, I was a bit concerned about how much spread we were going to see. Uh, and there has been you know, some cases within schools that have spread. But overall, I think we know that all these control measures uh, really, really work. And I hope with the layering on of the vaccinations, really, there'll be we, we really shouldn't see disruptions to our children's learning anymore. So we need to use all these tools that we have to, to make sure that we can, you know, keep the schools safe at this level as we open up society more, because as we see, you know, adults uh, going out to different things more often, there, there may be more COVID in the community, but if the kids also have those vaccinations, it's gonna make introductions into the classroom less likely. So, um, you know, overall, I think we're doing really well and I'm so excited that the, you know, we're at where we're, we are where we are, that we can add in the vaccines and make it even safer. Um, the idea of going back to online school makes my eye twitch. I don't wanna go back there. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> want to leave that in the past. Um, but, you know, uh, this, the province has uh, announced that rapid tests are going to be more available to kids. Uh, they've been available to teachers who haven't been vaccinated. And, Sam, we talked about maybe having children, uh, the need for children, making it mandatory for children. But should the province impose a mandatory vaccine policy for teachers and other education staff? Yes, I think I think that's really important. I think when you're um, working with children every single day and you're such a big part of their lives every day, I think it's really important that you do everything you can to keep them safe. Uh, so I, especially at the height of a public health crisis, I think that's the part that we keep forgetting because things are starting to feel a little more normal-ish. Um, we're still in a crisis. And what we're trying to avoid is a scenario where a new, more concerning variant emerges um, we don't want that to happen. None of us want that to happen. So doing everything we can, including making sure those in front of our most vulnerable right now, which are unvaccinated kids, um, can keep them safe, I think is a, an important move. And Janina, I'll let you have the last 30 seconds. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. I think we, we need to use uh, all the tools that we have. I think the, we're so lucky to be where we are and have these amazing uh, vaccinations that the, all of the data so far looks like they are safe and effective for all the age groups that they will be uh, available for. And I mean, we're, um, 
we really just have to, to be able to reach the people, get people information that they need, and then make these vaccines accessible uh, right across the province uh, to be able to continue you know, moving out of this and, uh, and, and really making the community as safe as it possibly can be. Janine and Sam, thank you so much. I think you've uh, uh, answered a lot of questions for parents across this province. We really do appreciate your time and all the work that you've been doing to guide us through this pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us thank for this. Yeah, thank you so much. How to describe our next guest? Well, he once hosted this country's equivalent of The Johnny Carson Show. He was a stand-up comedian at Yuck Yucks when Howie Mandel and Jim Carrey were there. He's been a journalist, documentary filmmaker, advisor to two different political parties, advisor to an Ontario College president. And now, thanks in part to some frightening developments in his health over the years, he's become a rabbi. But he hastens to add, not that kind of rabbi. He's here tonight because he summed up his eclectic life story in a new book called I Thought He Was Dead, a spiritual memoir. And we're delighted that it brings Ralph Ben Mergy to our airwaves tonight from Hamilton, Ontario. Hello, Raphael. How you doing? I am fine, sir. How are you? That was not a bad intro, wouldn't you say? Listen, it's like, you know, your eulogy. You're there for it. It's a good thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's just acknowledge off the top, you and I have been friends for 30 years. We've known each other a long time. I think we're good friends. But there were things I read in this book that were a real revelation to me. And, well, let's just go here off the top. You're on a table. You've had an angiogram. You got a doctor who tells you you got 95% blockage in a few arteries to your heart. What goes through your head at a moment like that? You know, it was such a strange experience because we have this idea that we're, you know, we're alive and we're going to be alive and you know, bad things, death happens to other people. You, you know, it's almost like you have to think that when you get up in the morning or else you don't really know what to do with your sense of purpose. But that was a moment where it was just like, Okay, as I watch them actually blow open the arteries and the tree of your heart, of the artery, arterial map of your heart just bursts open and everything gets blacker and more interesting, I just, I just felt relieved, but I'd also been very frightened. I mean, when they were trying to look for the vein on my hand to put the uh, uh, IV in, the woman said, you know, you, you're, you're constricted, maybe you're a little tense. And I said, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little tense. But it was a, it was a part of a whole process of, oh, I get it, mortality. Let's start looking at that. Well, you did ask the question which everybody asks, which is, why me? What answer did you mm -hmm. come up with? Uh, it's nothing personal, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I had a, a cardiac test at one point afterwards where they put a whole bunch of stuff on you and you do on a treadmill to see how you're doing. And I did ask, hey, you know, why me? And the woman said, what's your cardiac history in your family? And I just reamed off everybody in my family having heart disease. And she said, okay, so, you know, not, try not to be too hard on yourself. But as I say in the book, I, I almost took it as, okay, well then I, I have nothing to learn from this. I'm fine. And that was a bad idea because there was more to come and there was lots to learn. Well, in fact, I do remember well when you had sciatica and you had such pain and you had difficulty walking. And you say in the book that through that pain, you gained humility. And the question is, did you need to gain humility? Yes, I think we all need to gain our humility. And humility, by the way, something I've learned in the spiritual counseling work I do with people, humility is not, oh, deferring, oh, don't mind me, a little old me, I'm fine. Humility is knowing what place to inhabit in your life at any given moment. Sometimes you need to lead. Sometimes you need to just be quiet and follow. And humility is just finding a way to readjust yourself so that you don't have to either go big or go small or any of those things, but just say, what's needed for me right now about me and myself, me and other people, and me and my purpose in this world? Ralph, how old were you when your father died? Jeez, I was 33. I was working at Midday at CBC Television. Uh, when he died. Uh, uh, I was 30 when he got ill, uh, and I was out in Winnipeg doing some CBC, but 33 when he died, yeah. And, and I'd never he? seen someone die before. Huh. Um, he was 68. And it, three days before his retirement, he had a massive stroke. And th for three years, he just went downhill. And uh, on 
you know, when I was writing about this, it was something that it's hard to sort of write through the tears, but they phoned me from the hospital and said, your father's passed away. And I, I said, oh, it's not like I hadn't expected it. But I went down there and I looked at him and I realized I'd never seen someone who was dead before in my life. Hmm. And this was my father. And he was kind of, parts of him were warm and parts of him had already become cold. And I sat with him and I looked at him. And I, the one thing I realized there for me was there's, he's not there anymore. This isn't him. His soul had left. I truly believed in my soul and, and that we have one after that experience. Because looking at him, I realized, as Ram Dass says, it's just a spacesuit with your name on it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a mortal coil, as Shakespeare calls it. Well, one of the things I'm getting at here, too, is that you're not that far from 68, and I wonder whether or not this has, you know, his relatively young death has, I don't know, influenced, maybe haunted you through the course of your life that you think, I don't have much time, I got to get a lot done? No, I've heard that story from a lot of people. I'm not one of them. I, I, you know, I don't think if it happened to him, it has to happen to me. But I, I've always had a sense that we really shouldn't take for granted that this, you know, this isn't a rehearsal. This is our life. And we should try to do something good with it and something meaningful. And we should try to become better at it. You know, it's kind of the ability to refine that soul I was talking about. Try to make it a little better, improve a little bit on what you started with. But I've never really thought, well, you're doomed. Uh, on the other hand, I've never thought, oh, you're supposed... I, I do spiritual workshops with people on aging and, you know, when I ask them to write their own obituary, which is rather shocking for them to do, um, they usually say they lived to 97, died peacefully with their family <laughs> around them and their loved ones. And I just say, you know, at 97, what's life? Do you have a spouse? Are your friends still alive? Is it really physically easy to be 97? You know, it's not for sissies getting older. Oh, right? I hear that all the time. Now, we've talked about your heart blockage. We've talked about the sciatica. Then one day you look in the mirror and the septum in your nose has collapsed and then you got a cancer diagnosis. Yeah. Um, okay, let me do an excerpt from the book here and then we'll come back and chat. My nose was shrunken and malformed, my cheekbones an almost purple hue and my eyebrows bleached and mostly gone. Over the next few years, I had more reconstruction of my nose and eventually my normal color returned, but I will always look different. The person I was as I stood in front of the television cameras as a host of variety and current affairs programs for Canada's public broadcaster was gone. The challenge was letting go of that version of myself. Given how different you look, Ralph, did you still think you were you? Well, you know, it's a journey of self-acceptance. I remember the, the, the surgeon saying, you know, I can do this, I can do that, I can give you Botox every four months. And I said, you know, I, I got to learn how to live with this being me. Uh, but when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, I, I, up until I was a late teenager, I was quite heavy. And then I lost a lot of weight and all of a sudden I was thin and I had a jawline and cheekbones and, you know, women talked to me when they, before they talked to me about guys they liked. Now they actually talk to me. <laughs> and I had to accept that that person was not the same person I'd been. And then when this happened, I had to accept it again. And it, it's kind of a Buddhist meditation, really, on just impermanence, that we think we are a solid object. I am Ralph ben Murgy. I drink white wine, not red wine. I do this. I don't do that. And so it's important that these things are reminders that it's all impermanent. Everything is a rental. Just try to enjoy it while you're here. We are going to talk about the, the spiritual journey that you've been on a little more in, and, and the rabbinical work that you do. But, but before we get there, I do want to ask whether you think you would be as spiritual as you now are had you not had so many death-defying episodes in your life along the way? Well, it's a good question because, you know, I've always, I grew up in a traditional home. Uh, we came from Morocco and the kind of Judaism I come from wasn't one where you could be reform, conservative, orthodox, ultra, you were just in or out. And we were in. And it shaped me as a person. And, you know, in my late teens and mid up to my, you know, mid to late 20s, I had pepperoni pizzas. I hung out. I didn't care. Uh, and then I returned. I, even when I was starting out as a broadcaster uh, in my late 20s, I did return to my spiritual route through my religion. 
Um, because the way I see it is your spirituality is your relationship issue to yourself, to other people, and to the world. But religion is kind of like a fitness program, right? Like a Sabbath is a Sabbath for, for, for somebody who, who observes it. You don't go, I don't know, maybe not this week. You do it. And by, you know, if you want a six pack in the gym, you got to go to the gym. You can't just go to the gym and look at everybody else and go, well, I wish I was in shape. So there are things that can help us to get in shape. And I think I always clung to those throughout my life. So I would say with or without this, uh, uh, my spiritual journey was there no matter what I was doing. When I was doing Friday night, I actually thought to myself, I shouldn't be doing this on a Friday night. I thought, wow. That's weird. I didn't realize I'd think that. Uh, I, when I was doing midday, I thought, what if I showed up one day with a keeper on, with a skull cap, and just sat in the host chair? What would they do? Would they, oh, my God, what is he doing? Why is he wearing that? Oh, what are we going to He can't do any Israel interviews. You know, he's, 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 he's on a team. But, you know, we're all on our teams. <laughs> it's just if you make it visible, it becomes an interesting thing. But those urges were always in me, if that's the question. Friday night, I would just remind those who don't remember, it was the uh, Johnny Carson-like show that you did. Uh, boy, how many years ago was that now? Got to be almost 30. It was 92, I guess. We, yeah, we almost 30. There 91. we go. Yeah. How about that? All right. I mentioned in the intro that you have um, advised two different political parties, the Liberals and the Greens, and you yeah. wrote something about politics in your book that is really quite tough, and I want to read it here. You wrote, I still advise politicians I respect when asked, but when I left Queen's Park, I looked back over my shoulder, and what I saw was a broken system of male patriarchy, adversarial gridlock, and a profound tone of deafness to the society that was struggling around them. Pink palace indeed. You right there referring to the nickname of Queen's Park. I'm sure there's a lot of people who agree with that assessment of the place. Do you think there's any remote chance anything can be done about that? Under the present parliamentary system in which we exist, I, I don't see how. Um, you know, I was always amazed by, put it this way, if I said this in a marriage, the marriage would be over in 10 minutes. Uh, I am absolutely right and you are absolutely wrong on everything. That's just an absurd way to go about the business of helping people to have a better society. And I think that neoliberalism has done a lot to encourage that. That whole idea of, you know, what Thatcher said, there was no society. There were just men and women and families, and that's it. So the collective is not the point. Power is the point. And how you, you know, you can watch it in a political party when they have the scent of power in their nostrils, how everything changes for the people within that group. And the kind of tribalism and binary notions that were flying around that building, I just thought, we should be sitting in a circle here. We should not be sitting staring at each other, yelling over a floor, heckling and behaving. You know, when high school kids would come to watch, I'd be embarrassed to see, my God, this is what they, they see, a bunch of grown people yelling at each other to drown each other out. I mean, what is that? And when I think of the way we convene, we're on the wrong track. We're not seeing each other as having a, a valid contribution, having committees, not where I score points, but where we learn from each other. So for me... Uh, I, I couldn't help but feel that two things. One is that everybody in Queen's Park thinks that that's the whole world. Hmm. And then the second you walk out two blocks away from Wellesley and, 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 uh, and Bay, uh, nobody cares about what you're talking about in there because you're not really listening to them. Uh, people yearn for having a, a, an affordable life, a meaningful life, uh, a, a, a sense of belonging to something, a community, and they're not getting it from that. They're getting a a, a bunch of patriarchal uh, relationships. I mean, when I watch women trying to succeed, when I watch what happened to Kathleen Wynne as a premier and the kind of vitriol that went her way, I just thought, this is, what is that? That's Why are we doing that to each other? Why do we talk like this? You know, talk like a person, <laughs> as my mother would say. Hmm. Well, that does take me to your podcast because... Uh, you do offer a lot of life lessons and a lot of, uh, I, I would say, very helpful, very fascinating uh, spiritual conversation on your podcast, which is called Not That Kind of Rabbi. And you start every episode by saying, I'm a rabbi, but I'm not that kind of rabbi. 
What do you mean well, by that? I say is I'm not a rabbi. Uh, I'm an ordained spiritual director, mm -hmm. so I do spiritual counseling. But if I was a rabbi, I wouldn't be that kind of rabbi. That's it. In other words, yeah. I wouldn't stand there on, on the, the bima, as it's called, uh, you know, uh, at the pulpit and, you know, guide people as a sage. You know, I, I think we, we need more, you know, whenever you've done uh, a town hall and somebody says, I have a question, and then they stand up and they talk, they have an opinion for quite a while. <laughs> and as hosts, we think, oh my, we got to get them off this. But I also realized they have no voice. They finally get to say something that matters to them. So in Not That Kind of Rabbi, I try to talk to people about where they come from spiritually. You know, it's about, it's something we never talk about. It's, it's considered naive. I, I had to sit beside Richard Dawkins at a dinner once, you know, the atheist. And, uh, you know, he looked at me and he just said, you, you, you actually believe in these things, these fairy tales? And I said, uh, well, I mean, I'll ignore the fact that you just insulted me, um, but I would say that uh, your orthodoxy of atheism, it, it, uh, you know, profound belief that there is just the science of life, isn't enough for me. I, I think we live in a mystery. I, you know, when you when you walk through a forest, you, you get the cosmic joke. You're in on it. Mm -hmm. But when you sit there and think that everything is explainable, like why what's going to happen to us when we die just relax enjoy it <laughs> you know <laughs> cultivate your spiritual life and uh, make yourself available to the put it this way i work with a lot of greens i'm a strategic consultant to green parties and one of the things that really has upset me over the years is why aren't people can't why can't they hear this and i just think we've commodified everything to the point where there is no spiritual communal essence to things so we're willing to extract everything we can from resources and from people but we're not able to turn to each other and go you know i what, what do the hindus say we say hey, hey how's it going eh they say namaste i salute the god within you could you imagine a society like this walking around saying god isn't the word you're supposed to say <laughs> you know and we've become god we are now the ones who control the destiny, and we're not doing a great job. We're really bad at it. So I like trying to get people through not that kind of rabbi, through spiritual counseling, through this book. I like to get people to start thinking about those things when they start dealing with each other and not just put on their armor and go in for a fight. There's a wonderful story you tell in the book, and the scene, is, I guess I'll set the scene a little bit here. It's the Stephen Colbert show, the late night show on CBS, and he's got Keanu Reeves, the, um, I guess he's Canadian, isn't he? Yeah, the Canadian actor, uh, you know, very famous guy. And he asks Keanu Reeves this question. He says, let me ask you, what happens to us when we die, Keanu Reeves? And the audience, hip to the persona Reeves has cultivated over the years, roared with laughter, waiting for a Matrix-like answer. Reeves took a deep breath and answered, I know that the ones who love us will miss us. What do you love about that answer? Everything, because they were looking for, <laughs> you know, let's have some fun here. And the guy, you know, you can think whatever you want of his acting ability, um, but he's a sincere human being. And he said what was really the truth. Like when, when I was doing nine to five pounded out daily show work and then somebody would, I'd be leaving and they're, you're leaving. You know, we, you know, why aren't you staying? And I just go, you know, I got to go home because there's people there that I really hope when I'm going that they want to be in the room with me and they want to love me because I love them. And you guys are great and I love working with you. But the minute I stop working here, <laughs> it's over because it's all about proximity. So what I love about his quote is that's what we want. Who doesn't want people to, after at a funeral, not turn to the other person and go, eh, he was okay. But what's to eat? You know? <laughs> That's not what you want to hear. You want to hear, you know what? I'm going to miss that person. Not because I'm great, but because you meant something to them and you try to mean something to them, right? Well, this is, I'm glad you're being funny now because this is going to dovetail us nicely for the last segment here. And that is, okay, humor me for a second. How many years older than your wonderful wife are you? 16. 16 years. Okay. Last excerpt from the book. Here we go. What I usually tell her is, listen, after I die, I seriously don't want you to find someone else. 
As a matter of fact, even though I will be buried, as is custom in the Jewish faith, I want you to get an urn, a decoy urn, as it were. Put a big plaque on the front that just says, Ralph, and put it on the mantelpiece so that any potential suitors can look up and experience an immediate buzzkill. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing. You wrote it. <laughs> Ralph, were, were you ever worried that the more spiritual you got, the less funny you might get? Because I got to tell you, I don't think you needed to worry about that if that paragraph's any indication. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I, you see, this is the thing, right? If you talk about spiritual life, people think you're supposed to flow through the room with robes on and everything's great. You're in bliss. <laughs> Spirituality is messy, clumsy. I don't know how many clerics I've spoken with and done workshops with where I said, um, How's, how are you with getting it on with this God idea? And they say, you know, it comes and goes. Sometimes I feel it and sometimes I don't. It's not about certainty. You know, the Chinese saying, to be uncertain is, is uh, confusing, to be certain is ridiculous. Hmm. You know, like I, I, this is, spirituality is about at least trying to weave something into your life that isn't about the material positioning of you as a person. How am I doing? How am I looking? How am I feeling? You know, you got to have fun. People who don't have fun are missing something that is essential to spiritual life, which is joy. Let's finish up with this all-important question. How's your health now? It's good. You know, uh, I have to push myself to exercise as much as my, well, I'll never exercise as much as my wife, but I have to push myself to, to actually keep going and keep ex exercising. Uh, and yeah, I'm fine. I just have a... Uh, uh, things to look at and go, okay, well, if you want to do that, then, I mean, I'm a vegetarian. I've been a vegetarian for a long time. So for me, it's just trying to take care of the little things and making sure that I still have a 12-year-old a, a at home and a 15-year-old at home, and I have a 35-year-old and a 32-year-old. <laughs> so, you know, I say in the book, when people say, oh, it keeps you young, it doesn't keep <laughs> you young. It, make, it almost kills you. It's, it's just that you don't want to die. You don't want to let them down. So they're my incentive program. <laughs> <laughs> Your life has turned out just the way you planned, right? Yes. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I'm... I'm I'm very glad you're still alive, even though the title of your book is I Thought He Was Dead. It's a wonderful spiritual memoir, and we're really glad that it has brought the great Ralph Ben Mergie to our airwaves tonight. Thanks, Ralph, and be well. Thanks, Steve. Take care of yourself. Canada's rate of inflation hit 4.4% last month, the highest in almost two decades. Justin Chandler covers the Hamilton Niagara region for Ontario Hubs. He's been working on how that affects people who rely on the Ontario Disability Support Program, also known as ODSP. And he joins us now from Hamilton for more. Hey, Justin. Hey, Jan. All right, so before we begin, let's make sure we all know what we mean by inflation. Here is a quick primer. What is inflation? Inflation is the rising costs of goods and services, and it means just about everything you buy costs more. But how is it determined? In Canada, inflation is measured by something called the Consumer Price Index. The CPI compares the cost of goods and services today to the costs of those same goods and services a year before. The increase is the rate of inflation. Households spend money on everything from groceries, clothing, and entertainment to big-ticket purchases such as cars. The Consumer Price Index can't track every purchase. Instead, it uses a virtual shopping basket of about 700 goods and services Canadians typically buy. Each item is given a different weight, depending on how frequently households purchase it. So groceries are weighted more than things purchased less often, like haircuts. A moderate rate of inflation can encourage spending but rapidly increasing inflation makes goods unaffordable and can have a serious impact on the economy. In 1991, the Canadian government and the Bank of Canada started to set inflation targets to keep the economy in balance, following two decades of unstable inflation and unsustainable costs of living. The Bank of Canada raises or lowers its interest rate to try to reach that set target. The current inflation target in Canada is set at 2%. 
All right, Justin, let's talk about your article for TBO.org. You quote a McMaster University study about how people on social assistance are faring during the pandemic. What did you find in that? So this was a very interesting study that McMaster did. It was based on a survey of about 800 people. And they asked all sorts of questions about COVID-19, about finances, about people's thoughts on government. And what they found uh, repeatedly was that people on Ontario Works and Ontario Disability Support Program payments, um, people who are reliant on that, they were consistently having some of the worst outcomes when it came to uh, their financial stability, when it came to their health, as compared to people who were receiving the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit or to people who were not receiving any government supports. So I, I guess an example of this would be half of people on OW or ODSP uh, reported that they had no food to eat some days, whereas one in 10 CERB respondents um, said that and one in 20 people who had no um, support who responded to the survey said that. Now you mentioned OW, I want to clarify, Ontario Works and ODSP, yes. uh, the Ontario Disability. Um, yeah, so I, I want to actually pull up one of the uh, one of these quotes that you, you mentioned in your article. You spoke to one person who described something known as Hell Week. What does that actually mean? Yes, this was something that I learned through uh, Andrea Hatala. She's uh, in Toronto, she's a musician, she's also lives on ODSP. And what she told me was that the last week in the calendar month before people get their next check uh, is called Hell Week. And this is because it's the week that people have to make the most crushing and difficult decisions about their finances. Uh, when the money's running dry and when people have to decide whether they're going to eat or pay for medication or just how they're going to get by. Now, there is a big discrepancy between the cost of living right now and how much people receive on the Ontario Disability Support Program. Currently, what is the rate? What does someone get at the end of the month? And are there plans to increase that? So with the caveat that these rates change based on a person's situation, uh, the maximum amount that a person can receive is about $1,169 for a single person. Um, and that's assuming that they don't have um, other sorts of benefits or a different situation. But let's assume it's that. Um, the cost of living is much higher than getting that much per month. I think, as everybody knows, um, most people's rent would be completely eaten up by that. Um, but the rates have not gone up since 2018. Um, the government did not directly respond to a question that I asked about whether the rates would go up, uh, which leads me to believe, at least at this point, there are no public plans for them to do that. Early in the pandemic, there was a lot of pressure on food banks and other programs to sort of fill that gap. 20 plus months later, what, are we still seeing that sort of trend? Have we seen, uh, what, have, what are we seeing in there? We are, yeah. Actually, in that McMaster survey, over a quarter of respondents who were on OW and ODSP said that they were making more use of food banks. Um, but even now, I spoke to somebody at the, the Hope Center in Welland and they're still seeing, uh, as of September at least, an 8% increase year over year in food bank usage. And they're worried that as more federal income supports start to wind down, that's going to result in maybe a 30 to 40% increase. Now, we've talked about this on the on this program before. Um, people on CERB, and that's the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit early on in the pandemic, received substantially more. It was about $2,000 per month in comparison to the one, the eleven sixty nine that you would be receiving from ODSP. Does this make an argument to increase ODSP payments? Does this put any pressure that, hey, you know, this number, this blanket number of $2,000 was created to help people get through the pandemic, yet there have been people who have been surviving on less than that for quite a while? Well, certainly a lot of people are making that argument. This is something that I repeatedly heard while reporting this article. Um, now, one thing I should note, Andrea said, that one thing she wants people not to do is try to argue sort of over who had it worse. Um, so there's no, nobody saying that people on CERB should not have received this amount of money. They're just saying that perhaps this represents uh, the federal government acknowledging that that's at least a minimum amount that people need to survive. And that if that's a minimum amount, then ODSP would be a sub-minimum amount. Now, you spoke to someone from the ODSP Action Coalition, and they, as an organization, have a list of demands to sort of spark solutions. Can you give us some, some, some of those uh, solutions that they're asking for? 
Yes, they've got eight up on their website. These include sort of limiting the amount uh, that a person, sorry, increasing the amount that a person can earn before their income is deducted. Um, this also includes trying to index uh, to the rate of inflation so that ODSP payments go up more, also making it more accessible, uh, increasing the amount that people get for housing. So there's a whole lot of different ones here. Um, but one of those biggest ones is just raising the rates. Uh, very quickly, I do want to ask you, there was a quote in your piece that, uh, that read, in poverty, you're sort of obsessed with the fact that you have no money and obsessed with ways to get by. Um, this was a quote from Andrea Hatala. Um, does she hold out hope that her situation can improve and, and many others as well? So this is one of those stories where after you talk to somebody and um, you, you hear about these things, like after she's talking about Hell Week, um, where I was just saying to her, like, well, thank you for talking to me. I know this is this is difficult. Um, and she said, well, you know, th the only way this gets better is if we talk about it. And she she said, maybe there's not an easy solution here, but really people can put their heads together and we need to make sure that um, people who need it are getting the supports that they need to live well. Thank you so much, Justin. A very important story, and I'm sure we will continue to follow. Take care. Next week on the agenda. There were multiple cases where I was speaking with sources in China, uh, lawyers or activists, and they would suddenly stop responding to me because they had been detained into the system of secret policing. Uh, so unfortunately, right now in Beijing, if you're anywhere in that sphere where you could be seen as a critic, uh, where you are perhaps a threat to the Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy, you could face some pretty serious consequences. And increasingly, I think the world is paying attention because not only Chinese citizens, but foreign nationals, foreign citizens, are are getting swept up uh, in this reality of increasing crackdowns under President Xi. That's next week on the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, October 29th, 2021. Monday, we'll find out more about what's being called the Great Resignation, a COVID-era phenomenon where people are changing course in their lives and careers because of the pandemic. I'm Jan Jaganathan. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. Have a great weekend. And Steve, we'll see you again on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman.